Hello, my wonderful, beautiful friends. Guys, welcome back to our slash malicious compliance, where people get exactly what they ask for, and the stories are super satisfying. And in today's episode, guys, Karen dares OP to get her arrested, not knowing he's a policeman. <laughs> Ain't that something? Guys, I hope you enjoy the lineup today. Hit subscribe if you haven't. And as always, you can send or link your post to this email right here. We're diving in. So I work at a small Chinese restaurant that generally only has locals and regulars with the odd visit from out of the area. Because it's so small, on a normal day or night, we only have one waitress on a shift. We were having a relatively quiet night, so I was sitting around, pouring some soy sauce into bottles and cleaning chili jars. And that's when a group of four walk in. They're all relatively nice. I give them the good old casual greeting and seat them down. They do their stuff, order their meal, and for drinks, they only get table water, which is normal. When I bring out their food, the old man asks for a bottle of the red wine. Now, in my restaurant, we don't serve alcohol. Also, I'm not even 18 yet, so I can't even handle alcohol if we did. I tell him we don't have any alcohol in this establishment, and he goes on this rage, pointing out a bottle that was on the shelf. Now, I know what he was pointing to. It was our Chinese vinegar. The bottles look remarkably like Asian alcohol. They're green, with red on it, and the writing is in Chinese. And I told him that, sir, that's vinegar, not wine. Hearing me say that, he goes on this alcoholic rage, yelling at how stupid I am, how I couldn't know what alcohol was because I was underage, and how I was hiding alcohol from him, and he would make a complaint on our Facebook page. His children and wife look embarrassed, and they're trying to hide themselves, and his wife just gives me a look that says, just do it and he'll regret it. So in the middle of him yelling at me, I go get a bottle of the red vinegar and put it on the table. The old man makes a really big deal out of it, saying something like, Ugh, wasn't that easy? Waitresses in my day would have done it in two seconds. That's when I walk away, and when I turn around to check, he spat a mouthful of vinegar out onto the plate, and was trying to wash out the taste of the Chinese vinegar with water. Now, to be fair, the wife did come up to me later and apologize for his idiocy. They also never made that Facebook post. And they ended up paying $20 for the bottle since he took it straight to his lips. We never saw them again. Hey, sometimes you just gotta let people learn themselves, right? And honestly, I was expecting him to freak out at OP for letting him drink that red vinegar, but I guess he might have been too embarrassed to cause an even bigger scene. But what a rookie mistake though, not even taking a whiff before putting it to his lips. He deserved it. So I had just moved to Australia and I had gotten a new phone. But it turns out that my number was someone else's old number. Every other week, I would get calls by a tradie who wanted to know why I wasn't on site or what I wanted done with building project ABC. Every time I explained at length that they got the wrong number, quite often, folks on the other end were absolutely rude or thought I was messing with them and insisted I answered their questions or show up on site now. Now, I was over it. So I googled my own number, did some digging, and eventually found the guy who had my number before, found his new number, and then I called him. I politely explained my dilemma, pointed out that there were two websites that still had his old number up, and if he could please change this and let his contacts know his new number. By that time, I'd already used my number for work, visa applications, landlords and friends, and changing it would have been a huge pain. I explained all of that. Well, of course, he was just as pleasant as a lot of his contacts, and he told me something along the lines of, I don't give a flying F, mate. That's not my effing problem. Go get effed, sort your own stuff out. Well, the universe provides, and so I got a great opportunity to do just that a few weeks later. I received a call in the early hours of one morning by another disgruntled guy, telling me he was early and demanding to know where I wanted the sand put down and how to get in. I asked him what sand, and I was told that he had a full truckload of sand as ordered, and no one was on site and it was all fenced off. Very briefly, I did think about launching into my explanation of wrong number blah blah blah, but I was tired and over it and realized the opportunity provided. So I snap back at him with no uncertainty and say, Mate, it's all good. Just dump it right in the driveway, right in front of the fence. We'll sort it out when we get there. At that, the guy asked, Are you sure? It's a lot of sand. And I say, Absolutely sure, mate. Just dump it all. Thanks a lot. He then replies, All right, boss, and hangs up the phone. 
Well, I go back to bed, snoozing for another hour with a big smile on my face until my phone rings again, and I see it's my old mate with his new number who I had saved when I called him a few weeks ago. I pick up rather chipper, and he doesn't waste any time launching into a series of swear words at me, saying how he has no access to the site, and how he has to move a literal ton of sand by hand, and asked me whether or not I told the sand guy to dump it there. At that I replied, you told me to sort this out myself, this is me sorting this out, you can remove the numbers and let your contacts know or not, totally up to you, mate. At that, the guy was fuming. He called me a few more choice words, promising to find me and a lot more before we ended the conversation. However, the numbers disappeared from the internet really quickly after that, and I never got another call again. I still have my number. And every time I see a truck with sand, I chuckle to myself, thinking of this guy moving a ton of sand by hand and losing a fair few hours of labor because he was an idiot who couldn't be bothered sending a few texts. Guys, I will never get sick and tired of wrong phone number posts on this sub. Like, all the guy had to do was change his number and tell everybody about the change. He does sound like a really crappy employee, though. Like, how are you going to get anything done if contractors can't get in touch with you? But who knows, maybe he did that on purpose. Alright, so this little gem came from not me, but it's an older guy I worked with over the last winter break. We'll call him Jeff for simplicity's sake. Jeff was a delivery guide for a certain XYZ delivery company, and my job was a holiday helper. Basically, I assisted in delivering the influx of holiday packages. So a couple of days into my temporary job, we stop at a house with a pretty long, pretty steep driveway. I do my thing, step out of the truck, arms out for the package, but Jeff tells me not to worry about taking it to the door. Instead, we leave it at the foot of the driveway, near the mailbox. Now I'm not one to question it, I comply and leave it there. All the while, Jeff has this huge grin on his face as he blasts the truck's horn and waits a couple of moments. All of a sudden, there's movement from the house's front door. It's hard to see, but I can make out this tubby, balding, 40-something-year-old guy with a sour look on his face stepping out. We watch the guy, who we'll call Gabe, begin the long, arduous descent down his driveway, shuffling along at a slow pace. Jeff stays the entire time, grinning like an idiot while Gabe picks up his package, barely acknowledging us, and then he begins climbing back up his driveway. It's at that moment, Jeff calls out to him, Thank you again for choosing XYZ delivery, sir. We're proud to ensure that your packages arrive safely. Now I can tell it bothers the F out of that guy because he flips us off as he leaves. Jeff laughs, cranks up the truck, and we drive off. Completely bewildered, I turn to him and say, what the F was that about? Jeff only laughs again at this, in incredibly high spirits, and he launches into this explanation. So apparently the guy we just delivered to has had a history of effing over people he hires to do work for his home. At the time that Jeff got effed over, he'd been delivering to Gabe for years, and the guy had never been home, or he'd been home but never answered the door. Additionally, the guy's garage was always closed, which is important, because when it rains, it's company policy to leave a package just inside the garage door for safekeeping. So one day, it's drizzling outside, and Jeff delivers a package to Gabe's house. For whatever reason, the garage door is open this time, so Jeff leans in, plops the package a couple of feet from the cruddy weather, and then goes about his day as normal. So an hour later, Jeff gets a call from his supervisor who's in a massive frenzy saying, Jeff, what the hell did you do? Did you seriously mess up some guy's garage? How in the hell did you even do that? Hearing this, Jeff was taken aback, but he does his best to get to the bottom of things with his supervisor. Apparently, Gabe had seen Jeff deliver the package to his home, seen him lean in to place the package inside, and then claim that Jeff had broken the garage door. In reality, Jeff told me that Gabe's door was most likely broken, and that cheap bastard was looking for some poor bastard to pin it on. Fortunately, Jeff was able to escape any personal liabilities for lack of proof. However, XYZ Deliveries itself couldn't completely throw out the claim without engaging in a costly little court battle, as they indeed had a delivery man on the premises and no proof of when the thing broke. So they weighed the cost and they decided on a $600 payout, instead of the potential thousands it would cost in legal fees. Gabe, being the smug a-hole, got his garage repaired for free, 
Luckily for Jeff, however, a small loophole in the delivery company policy allowed him to exact revenge. So the loophole basically was this. In the case of delivering to locations where the delivery person feels that he's at risk or in danger, he does not have to risk his personal well-being by setting foot on said location's property. Instead, the said individual is allowed to drop the package off at the safest and most convenient location nearest to the individual's property, i.e. the mailbox or the foot of the driveway. Learning this, Jeff takes full advantage. The next package Gabe orders happens to be an expensive piece of electronics and it was marked urgent. Even better, it's raining the day of delivery. Absolute downpours. So Jeff pulls up to your friendly neighborhood a-holes place and he does the same thing he did with me. He blasts the horn several times and he waits. He then places the package just in front of the mailbox under the plastic tarp. Another policy in case of rain. Apparently Gabe really needed the package. As Jeff's horns draw him from his home and on a slow slogging descent down his driveway. He's fuming by the time he reaches the bottom with Jeff smiling like a professional. Gabe says, why the F did you not bring it up to my mother effing house? He said that as he grabbed the soggy bottom package. And Jeff replies, company policy sir. I can't set foot on a customer's property and risk further damages. At that, Gabe's mouth opened and closed like a fish as he tried to sort this out. He's completely soaked now and shivering, so he just said, go to hell. At that, Jeff responds, certainly sir, what kind of shipment would you like for that? At a loss for words, Gabe just begins slogging back up his driveway, with Jeff giving him a couple of friendly honks to send him on his way. He then continues on with deliveries. The entire incident took place a couple of years ago before I began helping Jeff. But to this day, he loves exacting company policy on the jerk. I felt a newfound respect for the man after that. And the rest of my time working as a delivery aide was filled with more awesome stories from Jeff, the good-humored delivery man. So it's funny how Jeff starts off looking like a real jerk, guys, but when you get the background story, it all makes sense. Like, what an idiot, though. If I was in Jeff's shoes, I'd be doing the same thing to Gabe. Like, serves the guy right for scamming the delivery company and putting the blame on Jeff. And I just want to add that I hope Jeff continues with this and he passes it on to the next guy if he ever switches jobs because brilliant malicious compliance. Not too long ago, I was a police officer here in England. I went from a team dealing with action-packed calls, speeding around in old Ford Focuses, dealing with interesting things, to working in a team that supported a large shopping complex. The uniform was a white shirt, black tie. And if I was out, a stab vest was over the top, with one of those big pointy hats too. If I was on break though, I would just put my normal jacket on to cover my shoulder numbers. So to a casual observer, I was just a normal person in a white shirt with a black tie. Cue the moment. I had just finished dealing with the paperwork from a shoplifting and had a hankering for a sandwich. With that, I locked my vest and hat away, but left my belt of tools on, which is a can of pepper spray, cuffs, and a metal stick. I then popped on my plain black jacket and ventured into the shopping complex in search of a foot-long sub. With the sandwich acquired, I paid the well-known outlets and ambled to a seating area to mind my own business and to chow down. Probably no less than five minutes later, I see a woman, the usual type, a Karen, attempting to buy a sandwich. Now from her big arm gestures, I skillfully deduced that she wasn't happy. That's not a crime, so back to my sandwich I went. Until, of course, the voices became raised and a hand was slammed on the counter. With that, I tucked the remnants of my sandwich in the bin and ampled over to see what the commotion was. Now, working in the team I did, I was a well-known face in the center. And I also enjoy a long sandwich, so the staff did know me and my job, so they relaxed a little which really irritated the woman. I quickly realized that they didn't have the filling she wanted and she was refusing to take no for an answer. I walk over and say, is everything okay here? The woman turns and eyes me over, thinking I'm a security guard and Karen says, look, I don't need damn security. This dumbass won't make me my sandwich. I reply, okay, firstly, you need to calm down. Secondly, I'm a level up from security. And Karen did not like this. She says, oh, piss off. I just want my sandwich. The woman then ignores me and goes back to banging her hand on the desk and gesturing wildly at the teen behind the counter. I tell her again, ma'am, you need to stop that or... She then yells at me again saying, I said piss off. 
I know the management here, so you'd better get back to doing your damn job or I'll get you sacked. I respond, I don't care, I'm warning you that you need to stop swearing and you need to calm down. Karen says, or what? I just want my sandwich, not some jumped up plastic policeman interfering. Go do your damn job. At this point, hearing her say that, I'm debating on doing my damn job and arresting her, but I do give her a second chance. I say to her, calm down, you're causing a scene and stop hitting the counter or you'll be arrested. Karen says, don't you dare tell me what to do. You are a stupid wannabe cop. If you think you can arrest me, do it. Try it. I'll be long gone before the cops arrive. The woman was slamming her palms on the sneeze guard with each word, and I think I'd been patient enough at this point. So I unzip my jacket to reveal that I'm in fact a uniformed police constable. Seeing that, Karen's eyes widen as she sees the handcuffs on my belt. I then say to her, you want me to do my job? I'm arresting you under Section 5 of the Public Order Act. The arrest is necessary to prevent injury to others and damage to property. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defense. Now, I had no intention of cuffing her. I was twice her size, so not necessary. Instead, I steered her while she spluttering to a table and I sat her down as I called for a car to pick us up. After another 30 minutes of her refusing to believe she'd done anything wrong, I eventually gave her a ticket to dispose of the matter. So her little sandwich swear fest ended up costing her 80 pounds instead. Way to go, Karen. All of this over a frickin' sandwich shop running out of ingredients. Some people really do lose their minds when they go hungry. And I love how Karen just kept telling him to do his job, not realizing that he was an actual constable and did have the power to place her under arrest. With that said, though, OP was really fair, though. He gave her so many chances to not get arrested, but she kept poking the bear. What a satisfying story. So this all happened about 18 years ago. I was a waitress for a village inn. I worked the morning shift because it had the most business. This was back when smoking was still allowed in restaurants, and we had a smoking section and a non-smoking section. Our seating chart was designed for this in mind and was never changed, even after the restaurant went full non-smoking. Now on Sunday, we had your wonderful church rush that would pack the entire place for hours. So Sunday was totally non-smoking until 3 p.m. On weekends, we would have about 8 servers. This meant that the smoking side had 2, while the other side had 6. If you worked the smoking side, you had 10 tables to take care of, while the other servers had 4. Management knew I was good at what I did, and would always place me in the biggest section on Sunday. And I could take care of all 10 of the tables, no problem. Now of course, servers always talk about their tips. And without fail, I always made more than anyone else, and this caused anger from the newer servers, and they said it's because I always got the better section. So with that, management came to me and told me what was going on, and that's when we decided on malicious compliance. So I tell the servers, okay, you can have my section next Sunday, and I'll take the small section. But since I'm on the other side of the restaurant, I won't be able to help you as much. With that, I got to enjoy a less stressful Sunday, did my job as normal, turned my tables, and made a ton of money. The other server was running around like crazy, not getting much done. At the end of the shift, they learned that they made less than the week before because of how bad they were taking care of their tables. And church crowds are horrible if you aren't taking care of them right. It's always great to hear the server say, you can have your section back, I don't ever want it again. Now this wasn't a one-time thing, this happened many times over the five years I worked there. Every time it happened, I still made more money. And every time we would get a new server complaint, I would just smile and say, go ahead, take my section, I could use a break. Yeah, so I guess a lot of the workers just wanted more money without doing the work that came along with it. No, no, you misunderstood me. What I wanted to do was the same amount of work I used to do and get more money. This person comments, I work in restaurants and it's a running joke that the worst slash least competent servers are the ones who always complain about their tips. Can you believe this table only left me this amount? Yes, yes I can. Years ago, I was in a bad car accident. An older man turned left in front of me at an intersection and he T-boned me. Ambulances were called and I was put on a backboard with a neck brace and brought to the hospital where I was deposited on the gurney in a hallway as there were no rooms available at the time. I laid there for quite a while, waiting to be seen. 
My injuries weren't bad. Basically, I just got banged around and bruised up, so I was okay with the waiting. But I was in pain, and laying on my back was very uncomfortable. I didn't think there was anything wrong with my neck. The only pain I felt was due to the damn neck brace digging into the bottom of my skull. And I really, really wanted to lay in a different position. Not only to alleviate some of the pain in the rest of my body, but also because I was parked right under a light that was blaring in my eyes the whole time. So with that, I started taking off my neck brace. That's when a nurse spots me doing this and she runs over very upset with me and told me I had to keep the neck brace on. I tried telling her that my neck was fine, but she was adamant that I do not remove the brace until the doctor examined me. Which I do get. I'm guessing at the very least, it goes very much against protocol, and at the very worst, it'd be a huge liability if I took the brace off and there was something wrong. Plus, I didn't want to piss off the nurse or be one of those patients, so I begrudgingly complied, even though I thought it was overkill. I tried to reposition myself as best I could to the least painful position, not very successfully, unfortunately. However, the damn light blaring directly down was driving me crazy, even when I closed my eyes. Finally, out of frustration, I just took the blanket that was over me, pulled it up more, and threw it over my head, thinking, oh, finally, no more light in my eyes. Bliss. After doing this, I just laid there trying to block the pain and daydream to pass the time, wondering how long I would be there for. Not too long after, I hear sounds like a bit of commotion, and someone saying something about a dead person in the hallway. I was like, oh my goodness, that's freaky. Now I get that there's no rooms available, but to leave a dead body just laying out for everyone to see, I thought it was super creepy. Suddenly, the same nurse that gave me crap about the neck brace pulls the blanket off my head, scaring the crap out of me. And she starts yelling at me that I'm not allowed to put the blanket over my head, and what the heck I was doing. It was then I realized that the dead body they were talking about was me. I start laughing and say, oh crap, I'm so so sorry, I just wanted the light out of my eyes, and I can't move my head with the damn neck brace on. To say the nurse was not impressed would be an understatement, but she did find a room to move me to, and she positioned me not under any light, which I thanked her very much for. She just gave me a surely look and walked away. Guys, I love this post so much, especially love the fact that Opie thought that he was in a hallway with a dead guy, when in fact he was the dead guy. That was my laugh for the day. With that said though, definitely keep the neck brace on. Good thing the nurse saw Opie trying to take it off before anything potentially serious could have happened. This person comments, yeah, I've had a patient yell at me that their neck is fine, but they have severe cord compression and they're one wrong move away from being dead. Glad to hear that Opie is fine after that, guys. And that, my friends, brings us to another end of our slash malicious compliance. Guys, I hope you enjoyed today's super satisfying stories. If you did, hit that thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing so you don't miss these crazy stories. And if you missed yesterday's episode on the channel, it's an r slash entitled people episode where an entitled Karen demands OP's underwear for her daughter. It's a wild story, so go check it out if you haven't. And myself and Stevie Boy will see you guys in the next one. We love you.